This is the Hollywood Outsider, a weekly entertainment podcast where this week we are reviewing The Possession and 2016 Obama's America. We're going to look at upcoming releases, Resident Evil Retribution, and Finding Nemo 3D. Our From the Outside In topic this week is we're going to talk about the best and worst from this past summer's films. As always, the latest in movie and TV news, our own trivia and flashback DVD segments, including this week's contest winner. With that, I am your host, Aaron Peterson. With me today are my fellow hosts, Brian Williams. Hey, what's up, Aaron? Not much, man. And Scott Clark. Hey, what's going on, Aaron? Not much. As you guys may or may not have noticed, the uh, vocal stylings of Justin McCumber are absent this week. He just moved into a Casa de Mansion and will not be joining us. He's busy. Apparently, Amazon's been pretty good to our boy. <laughs> <laughs> He's got all kinds of new shit done back. He's got a pool. He does have a pool. Looks pretty bitchin'. And we're going to put his address and link on the page. So <laughs> pool, be sure party to check that pool party at McCumber's. Pool party at McCumber's. Uh, what else is going on? Well, we had our college radio booth, RockfordCollegeRadio.com. We had our booth there. How'd that go? That was pretty interesting. Yeah, I think you're interested to go back to college. <laughs> <laughs> you know what I'm saying? It, it was kind of weird. We had a couple people come. I don't know if you were there when Lady came up and said she was a big fan. No, no, no. We tell what oh, actually happened. You got a different story. Go ahead. <laughs> so Aaron and I are both wearing uh, our I'm a Ho t-shirts, uh, standing there kind of pimping, uh, pimping the show a little bit. This cougar walks up to me and says, how much? <laughs> and then pointed at me and said, "I'll take both. I'll take both." Of I'll them. Take both. <laughs> uh, but we did have several fans. That was kind of cool to, to see people and and get to talk to them. So that was neat. It was a lot of fun. And we have some pretty exciting news in the near future, but we're not ready to share it just yet. So hopefully, stay tuned. It'll probably be in next week's episode. So come back, come back, come back. It's awesome too. It's awesome. Let's go on to movie news. Uh, Warner Brothers picked up the screen rights to The Planet Thieves. It's a young adult novel by Dan Crocus. Pitched as Harry Potter in space, and it doesn't even hit stores until next May. I, I've never heard of this story, so I had to do a little research on this because um, I never heard of it until today. But I found it interesting that a, uh, an article I read pitched this as Star Trek meets Rick Riordan, who, of course, I had to look up because I'm not a writer like McCumber. Mm-hmm. Um, that's the guy that wrote the Percy Jackson the Olympian series, so kind of interesting. Um, I am a bigger fan of sci-fi than mysticism, like with the Harry Potters and the Percy Jacksons, mm-hmm. that kind of thing. So I'm a little, a little interested in this one. It's got my interest peaked. Um, and these young adult novels being made into films has become very popular with the advent you know, of Hunger Games, obviously, and um, uh, Matched, which we're going to talk about later. So I, I think this, this could be pretty interesting. Is this like the literary or movie equivalent of maybe a, a, a big-name college recruiting a 13 year old basketball player or football player, you know, in <laughs> middle be. school. I feel like it. Yeah. Kind of. You know, it, because it's like, okay, the book hasn't even come out and it won't come out for another, what, nine, 10 months? Right. <laughs> I mean, how, how much does this guy have done and how much have they seen of it to where, I mean, this, I mean, good for him. Congratulations for getting this, you know, sold, but. And it, I, you know, and it really kind of sounds interesting. I don't, you know, it's a, it does revolve around a, a young space cadet and is, I guess, ship happens to be carrying some big weapon on board and these aliens that are apparently trying to take over Earth, they really want this weapon. So, of course, he's got to fight them off, but I'm not sure how they're working. Apparently, I guess there's a magic or mystical thing involved here, too, because they keep, ref, you know, referring to Harry Potter. You you know you said they refer to it as the uh, the guy that wrote the <clears throat> Percy Jackson movie or books. books. So sounds I mean it sounds promising, but I just it's just it's just funny how things get done on spec uh, spec right right. Yeah, it's definitely a spec script, but I think it sounds cool. I want to see a bunch of witches and shit flying around in space. Well, see, I don't know. <laughs> I don't know if the I think the appeal or the comparison to Harry Potter isn't so much the mysticism, at least from what I read. Maybe I'm wrong. I could be because, again, I don't know a whole lot about this. But You're making me very sad. I'm looking really forward to Witches in Space. Witches in Space sounds... <laughs> okay. I, I, I think the, the draw is the younger person being put into an adult situation. Because apparently, from what I read, the crew is wiped out. And he basically has to man this ship by himself or, or take the lead of the ship because there's no adults around kind of thing. Oh, then he's going to meet a chick named Bella and it's all going to come together. <laughs> That's right. Yeah. Yep, you got a big werewolf with a big bubble glow. <laughs> Dome hat and ray guns and <laughs> again well, I don't know for certain I'm saying I, I, I've read what I could find and mm-hmm. again this is a book that doesn't come out so what I know is is speculative at this point so yeah well, let's see what happens with it uh, let's go on to Brian's favorite actor Ryan Gosling's directorial debut 
called How to Catch a Monster. We'll be starring his Drive co-star Christina Hendricks as a young woman who must travel into a dark fantasy underworld to find her son. Believe it or not, I'm actually kind of intrigued and pretty curious about this movie. Because Christina Hendricks is in it or because you love Ryan Gosling? It's more about his undertaking of such a, I guess, an ambitious uh, project, something that's really kind of from left field. The basic plot for this is, and, I, and I'm quoting from Variety here, it's a uh, mm-hmm. dark fantasy underworld uh, while her teenage son discovers a secret road into an underwater town. That's pretty out there. Yeah. So, hey, more credit, you know, I gave him props. So That's pretty it's, bold. It's, That's a bold Yeah, it is. It is. For, for your directorial debut, this is a pretty big, pretty big thing. So I'm kind of curious as to what kind of visual style he'll do, but we'll, you know, we'll have to wait a couple of years, I'm sure, before we, we see it. But I don't like the title. How to Catch a Monster? Yeah. I thought it was like a serial killer movie. I keep picturing Ryan Gosling walking in and have a seat. <laughs> like, like it's, instead of to catch a predator, how to catch a monster. No. <laughs> nice. So uh, wow. you uh, had this. Why, why do you have a trunk load of vodka and condoms? <laughs> I was just going to teach her a lesson. <laughs> Don't do this stuff. Oh, boy. All right. Twilight director David Slade is in negotiations to direct Matched, the Ali Condi young adult book series about a girl in the dystopian future where choice is taken away and falls in love with someone she is not matched with. Like I said earlier, the young adult book to film thing is the next big thing. It's a craze, man. Yeah. So um, I, I think it's important to note that the David Slade, um, obviously a very popular series Twilight, but he mm. also did that movie Hard Candy. Which mm-hmm. was awesome. If you haven't seen that, that is some... That's the Ellen Page one, right? That's yeah. a really dark, oh, yeah. creepy-ass movie. really is. And it is creepy and dark, but but it's not what you think it is in the first 20 minutes of that movie. And where that goes is 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 pretty gruesome and brutal. And, and Isn't that... Wouldn't you say that's one of those movies where you watch it and you don't really want to watch it again, but it's still good? Yeah, yeah. exactly. Yeah. So <laughs> definitely check that one out. But that, I think the direction in that was was pretty good, too. So... That said, he's obviously a good fit for the romantic movies coming off of Twilight. I just wonder if the people that are anti-Twilight fans are going to automatically hate this just because his name's attached to it. Uh, I think most of the people that are anti-Twilight probably don't even know his name. I don't think his name is... You don't have to. They're going to say, from the director of Twilight. Oh, that's true. Yeah. You know, I mean, it's... That's true. Good point. Scott had a good point. Write that down. Whoa. God. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, Of course. Cut that out and play it for, you know, put it in a loop for the outtakes. Hear it over yeah. and over again. Just play it over and over and over. Uh, the Hobbit films, everybody's excited. Uh, the titles are official, the release dates are official, and they were firmly announced. An Unexpected Journey hits theaters December 14th of this year. The Desolation of Smog hits December 13th of next year. And There and Back Again, which I think is a horrible title, July 18th, 2014. You know, for a few years, I always kind of look forward to the end of the year because. Harry Potter would come out around Thanksgiving, and then a few weeks later, Lord of the Rings would come out. So for about a month, it was really cool to, to be a moviegoer. Mm-hmm. And this is kind of going to get get me back to that feeling. Pretty excited about it. I mean, I'm, it's something to look forward to over the next you know next couple of years to uh, to get our Lord of the Rings fix here. So how can you hate the title there and back again? That's like a great ending to the series. I just think it sounds bland. But it's right from the from the book. That was the name of the book that he wrote. Remember? I don't. I just think it sounds bland. I think try yeah, something at, catchy. At the, something the, at the end of the trilogy, when they close a book, it's that's there and back again. The title. I, there and I again. understand that, but I also I don't know. I just didn't like it. I don't like the desolation of smog. I think that, I was going to say that <laughs> that one like doesn't roll the like, at all. Speaking of dystopian futures, it, it sounds like something you know, Escape from L.A. <laughs> <laughs> Kurt, Kurt Russell's going to pop up in the shower. <laughs> Draw. <laughs> <laughs> you shall not pass, <laughs> bitch. <laughs> uh, okay, we talked about it in the whole mail a couple weeks ago, but Jim Carrey is now officially confirmed as the colonel for Kick-Ass 2, so I guess we're a lot smarter than we thought we were. I, I don't know about you guys. I'm not really surprised by this. I, I think now I'm that... not, because I wouldn't, we wouldn't have it on the format if I didn't think there was a good chance. <laughs> right. But I, I think this is something that was needed for the series, because now that I, too much to... Uh, Brian's enjoyment. Hit girls getting older, so they need they need a new novelty for mm-hmm. the series because you know you don't have the the twelve year old girl that's kicking ass and taking names anymore. You got to have something something else to draw it in. Because let's or, be honest, that's a twelve year old girl dropping the c word. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. When it's, she's like a seventeen year old girl, that's pretty much like going to any high school. Yeah. So. <laughs> uh, I don't know. I've said it before. 
I'll say it again. I am not excited by this. I, I really am more turned yeah, off. But, but that was, you know, we talked about that though. It was more of him being a, uh, being a villain. That mm -hmm. was kind of the assumption we were under, wasn't it? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, he's more in this role. It looks, I think he's playing, it's supposed to be playing kind of an inspirational role to the, to the uh, do-gooders. So well, I'm sure we'll switch sides at the very last minute and we'll all be like, oh, shit. Didn't because isn't the red, red Mist supposed to be the villain from the... F yeah, it's supposed to be. Yeah. It's supposed to be. But like I said before, I think Jim Carrey detracts more than interests me in anything he's in anymore. He's, I just think he's become too much of a caricature yeah. for, for me. I'm I used to love Jim Carrey. I just, I just don't get excited about him anymore. I'm hoping to be surprised by him. That's, that's what I'm... I hope to be too. Mm -hmm. But if he goes all mask-like... It's just going to be, you know. <laughs> All righty then. And they said Nicholas Cage is <laughs> really? back. Did, didn't he die? He died a lot. He, did, <laughs> he didn't just die. He died a lot. He got <laughs> shot the fuck up. It's been a little while since I've seen it. That's why I, I kind of had to ask about that. But you do flashbacks? No, I'm pretty sure he got shot like 64 times. So I don't, <laughs> I don't know how he could come back. I mean, granted, I know he needs the work. But, you know, whatever. They could do flashbacks or something like that. They could. Yes, that's probably what they'll do. How are they going to flash back to Hit Girl pretending to be a 12-year-old when she's 16 now? <laughs> 17, whatever she is. Yeah. <clears throat> okay. How old is she, Brian? <laughs> <laughs> you got your clock ready? Oh, nope, don't have it up. Sorry. Um, Michael Clark Duncan, this is kind of sad news, but Michael Clark Duncan had a heart attack apparently back in July and never fully recovered. So he passed away at 54 years old. For people that are unfamiliar, he's kind of a, a cult icon. He was in The Green Mile. Uh, he played the Kingpin and Daredevil. He's been in a lot of movies. You'd know him if you saw him. Big, right. black, gentle giant. Played Bear in Armageddon. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but by all accounts, just a just a really sweet, sweet guy and, and very well liked. And I loved his roles. I, I thought he just, he, he just, for being such a huge guy, he could play such a sweet, gentle soul. Yeah. You know, so. Yeah. <clears throat> his, uh, one of the articles I read, they, they mentioned his agent had said he was the only guy that he's known where instead of. Instead of people approaching him to shake his hand, they would just walk up to him and hug him. <laughs> and I kind of awesome. think that says kind of a lot to you know, the roles that he played. You always kind of felt a connection to him, you know, maybe except for the kingpin. But <laughs> you always kind of felt like you, you were seeing a little bit of him. Right. Exactly. Yeah. Just a very, very sweet guy by all accounts, not just from Hollywood accounts. From, 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 from like, He's one of those guys you just you kind of wanted to meet. You know what I mean? Like you want to yeah, be buds I, with yeah, him. Yeah, he's one of those guys that you think you would have a good time just hanging out with. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And uh, and really one of the more iconic voices in Hollywood. Yeah. Oh, great Super voice. Super deep voice. Yeah. I wish I could get even half as deep as his voice right. is. Okay, now let's go on to... Welcome to Brian's Trailer Park. All right, what would you do if you and your sister, or if you're one of our many lovely lady listeners out there, you and your brother... If you were almost killed and eaten by a witch, you know, me personally, I'd probably be sitting in a padded room the rest of my life. But then again, I'm not Jeremy Renner. <laughs> who in is? Hansel and Gretel, Witch Hunters, Renner and his sister Gretel, who's played by Gemma Arterton, bring a whole lot of whoop-ass to the covens around the, their neck of the woods. Scott, will you be donning your leather Renaissance fair garbs to see Renner and Gemma kick some witch's booty? I... I... Absolutely think so. This is definitely kind of a guilty pleasure movie, but it looks a hell of a lot of fun. Reminds me of a darker, well, I don't want to say darker, but it reminds me of Van Helsing a little bit. Yeah, it very much reminded me of Van Helsing. And this this fairy tale story is set in realist, realistic-ish settings, you know, with just live action characters. <laughs> I wouldn't go that far. Well, you know what I mean. They're like live action kind of, it's become yeah. very popular, like with Snow White and that kind of thing. Here's what I loved about the trailer. My favorite thing in the trailer was that they did. Gemma Arton, Art whatever her name is, was that? Right. <laughs> Let's just call her Gemma. Sorry, go ahead. Gemma? Gemma, yeah. What I loved about the trailer is that they don't show you what's coming at them from the – that's coming out of the bushes. So many of the trailers in the last few years – Oh, the big, big monster. Whatever the big show. monster is, they don't even give you a glimpse of it. They just – they show the characters going, what what the hell is that kind of thing? And You've got to be kidding me. And mm -hmm. they don't show it to you. I resp I love that because I want – there's so many trailers lately that I've, I've seen cool things in the trailer that I'm like – that needed to be a surprise when I saw the movie. And that's going to be a surprise when I go well, see it. Right. That was, you know, earlier this year, talking about John Carter, that was one of the problems I had. Mm -hmm. The big, the one scene that they showed in every single preview was the big white gorilla looking thing in the arena. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. And, and that really would have been, if, if, you know, if you did not know that was there, that would have been a, a pretty intense scene. I agree. But because you, you not only see that, you see that he 
he defeats it. When that yeah. scene happens, you're not at all worried about the hero. Exactly. Not only do but you like, see he defeats it, but he's got his blood all over him. Yeah. Right. You know, you know but but you know, to your point, this is this kind of backs that up where it is nice to see, oh hey, they're scared of something, but we don't know what it is. I gotta go see this to kind of find out. It leaves you some intrigue to want to go see it. It does. Right. And you know. I, it does worry me though. Not just because Jeremy Renner is in it and he's been in every movie I've seen in the last six months, <laughs> but because the movie looks like it, it could easily become uh, a bad Stephen Summers movie. You know, where I wasn't the greatest fan of Van Helsing, but I saw it with a, the good potential. This one looks like it could, it's teetering real between a hell of a lot of fun and DVD stock. You know what I mean? Uh, I think that's. Well, see, to me, I, I, there is that kind of steampunk type mm-hmm. Victorian mm-hmm. era. Uh, you know, feel about it, kind of like Van Helsing, but I really kind of thought it was more like the Brothers Grimm. Yeah, that's a good which, comparison. Which to me was entertaining, but in retrospect, it was really not that good. And so that's what scares me about this: that and the fact that they're brother and sister, but yet she has an accent and he doesn't. <laughs> That's okay. I don't know if anybody picked up on that. <laughs> I get the impression that this one doesn't take itself as seriously as Van Helsing did. Van Helsing didn't seem to have a whole lot of tongue in cheek with it. It just it was just silly for the sake of being silly in some cases. That's fair enough. I guess. This one seems to be making jokes at itself a little bit in a couple spots, at least in the trailer. Well, uh, January thirteenth, two thousand thirteen, is when this movie hits the big screen. And uh, next up is the company you keep. It's a political thriller with Robert Redford heading up an extraordinary ensemble cast. It's about a single father in upstate New York whose life has been turned upside down when he is pegged as a shooter in a bank robbery that, that took place years ago. He goes on the run to find an old girlfriend who can vouch for his innocence. Just a few of the huge cast includes Susan Sarandon, Nick Nolte, Shia LaBeouf, Sam Elliott, Stanley Tucci, Anna Kendrick, and Terrence Howard. And there's still probably half a dozen more big name actors in this. Mm-hmm. Um, I've got the plot pinned down about as simply as I can, but it kind of looks like there's a lot much more going on here. What do you think, Aaron? I'm really pumped for this movie. This this is more my kind of movie than Hansel and Gretel is. Uh, I love espionage thrillers, spy thrillers, that sort of thing. Even though last week or the week before I told you how much I don't like Shia LaBeouf anymore because he keeps bitching about his how he became successful and now he hates big screen success and <clears throat> Steven Spielberg's uh Steven Spielberg bag bag Spielberg fuck <laughs> Spielberg Bivens yeah <laughs> Steven Spielberg fucked up the Indiana Jones series etc cetera, etc cetera. I think this is the kind of role that is tailor made for him he, he seems to fit in perfect and I love Robert Redford I think the guy just has charisma out the ass even if he does need to see somebody about his face and get that you know maybe some sandpaper just iron it out some spackle some, sp- <laughs> some spackle something like that i think it looks like a, a kick-ass movie it's something i would really want to see i'm really surprised especially what you said last week about about shia no, i still don't like shia but he i, I can accept a but douchebag in a, in a good role there's there's enough other big name people to kind of oh, cover yeah. up his being in the movie seriously the, the <laughs> shot in the trailer when they fill the screen with all the actors in here like holy crap there's like a four by four row of like well a lot of people would would love to work with robert redford i mean he's an icon so the one i can't stand and i may be alone in this i can't stand susan sarandon what i cannot stand her i, I i've never found her remotely attractive I, oh I, you're oh. mistaken no now, now you're going overboard she, i don't mm-hmm. know I'm, i got a bad taste I, I, i'm also she bugged. made transvestite sexy okay <laughs> i'm just saying yes Plus, I just have this thing about actors that use their celebrity for political See, reasons. There's no, where the I, truth I've is. Got, no, no, no. no. I've, I've got, yeah, okay, I've got some, I guess, maybe personal issues with what, you know, maybe as vocal as she is, but but movies-wise, I love her. I've, and still th- and think she's still pretty hot. <laughs> I, I've never liked her even before I knew about the, the politics stuff, and it's not even it's so not you even saw about her what, and you went, ugh. Like Bull Durham, everyone's talking about how hot she was in, in that. I just, I just don't find her attractive. She's got... Big bug eyes. I don't think I just I just never liked her. Oh, wow. like, somebody's bitter. Did you get rejected? Did you send her a fan letter? Yeah, I did. <laughs> she sent it back and said, "F you, Scotty." Must be the redhead thing. I don't know. No, oh, well, you, you're mistaken. Um, you normally I'd say everybody's entitled to their opinion, but you don't. You don't get one. Not, not in that respect. <laughs> I, knew, I nope. never do anyway on this show. That's true. Uh, well, the, I'll start now. <laughs> 
I don't. The story looks a very interesting concept. I, I think the role looks really good for Shia, like you said. I'm I'm interested to see it. Yep. All right. Well, cool. Well, the company you keep opens a couple weeks before Thanksgiving on November fifteenth, and it's not too early for Christmas shopping. So stock up on your I'm a Ho t-shirts <laughs> while you can. They track cougars. They <laughs> yes, they do. Uh, they are becoming more and more popular, so get yours now so you can tell everybody. I got mine before they had their TV show. <laughs> <laughs> so go to www.thehollywoodoutsider.com to get yours now. If you got something you need to get off your chest, then send us an email at feedback at thehollywoodoutsider.com. You can also tweet us at H underscore outsider and check us out on facebook.com forward slash thehollywoodoutsider. Stump the hoe. Stump the Ho. Each week, one of our hosts poses a trivia question to the remaining hosts and attempt to stump their fellow hoes, hosts meaning Hollywood outsiders. This week, it's my turn. So, are you bitches ready? I'm ready. It's really sad, because if Justin was here, he would love this question. So, yeah. Yep. All right. You guys ready? We're, we're going to review The Possession here in a, shortly, and Jeffrey Dean Morgan is the star of The Possession. So, the question is, you ready? <laughs> The Possessions Jeffrey Dean Morgan starred in the critically adored comic book adaptation Watchmen. For whatever reason, that film's trailer remi- remains one of the most popular trailers of all time. True story. Yet only two characters actually speak throughout the entire trailer. Morgan's comedian is one. Who is the other? Is it A, Dr. Manhattan, B, Rorschach, C, Night Owl, or D, Silk Spectre? Which other one speaks in the only trailer? Only two of them speak in that trailer. Okay. I'll go with Rorschach. You go with Rorschach? Right? Yep. Uh, and Scotty? I, I, dun, dun, dun. I, Mr. Manhattan. I, th- I could have swore it was Mr. Manhattan. Okay. Scott goes with Mr. Manhattan. We'll find out the answer a little later in the show. Right now, let's go to the big screen and review any recent releases. <clears throat> the first one is The Possession, which I saw. And apparently I saw the only two major releases this week because you bitches were sitting around getting ready for football. So, Are you ready? <clears throat> I'm ready for some football. Don't quote Hank Williams. He's not allowed anymore. <laughs> Banned. Very, very naughty man. The Possession is about Clyde. He's a divorced absentee dad played by Jeffrey Dean Morgan, which we just talked about. He takes his two daughters to a yard sale <laughs> where the youngest, M, begs for a Dybbuk box. This cute little girl gets what she wants, as all of them do, and <laughs> it starts possessing her. Clyde tries to get his ex's help, but she thinks daddy's gone crazy, so Clyde enlists the help of a Jewish priest. I think it's called a priest. I don't know what they're called. And the exorcism is about to begin. So the story, bottom line, you've seen this shit a hundred times before. The only difference this time is a kid gets possessed by a freaking jewelry box. That's what it looks like. I, it's really weird because the box actually starts talking. And it's weird to see a jewelry box talking. Does the lid like go up and down? Like At some point it does eventually go up, yes. <laughs> Feed me, Seymour. <laughs> That's what I kept thinking. <laughs> Uh, there's a couple of nice twists, and as a dad who dealt with, with exes, I completely related to one of them. <laughs> so that was pretty clever. But unfortunately, for every clever twist, there's there's some cheesy-ass dialogue that wipes it out. I mean, that's that's the film's big – the one big crutch is some piss-poor dialogue in a few scenes. Like, hmm. um, one, they're trying to create tension, and they're walking into a hospital, and one of the characters says, I hate hospitals. People die here. And it's supposed to be so dark and dreary, and, all, and I went with my daughter, and we just started laughing in the middle of the theater. Which was awful. I'm like, who writes this? I mean, it's just bad. Soap opera bad. Only in a few spots, but it's enough to take you out of it. Oh, yeah. Completely, yeah. It's too bad. Um, the acting, Jeffrey Dean Morgan, he does a really effective job, I think, of making me believe in his plight. Kara Sedgwick plays the, plays the mom. She was on the, um, what was her show, Brian? The Closer? The closer. The closer. Okay. Or Kira. Kira? Yeah, a, Kira? Kira Sedgwick. Well, see, I'm not allowed to say names. I She's never married to right. Bacon, right? Yeah, she's married to Bacon. <laughs> she's married to Kevin Bacon. Um, she did a bang-up job as a woman trying to protect her kids, so I like her quite a bit. The parents needed to be right, which they did. They got that, those parts right. But everything fails if this little possessed crazy chick makes you laugh every time you see her. Natasha Callis plays M, and she did a very good job. For being, a, would say, probably 10, 12 years old, whatever she was, she does a good, not great, but a very good job of, of handling all the various transformations called for in the movie, playing the different roles, handling going from a normal sweet little kid to this kid that's possessed, has no idea what's going on, to being a downright evil little shit. So she handles all of it, and she does it very well. <clears throat> the production, the look of this movie looks like something from the 70s. Um, I, I've probably seen a, 
I don't know, probably a thousand horror movies in my lifetime. And I rarely jump at any of them. I mean, you've been in movies with me, Scott. I mean, paranormal activity movies, maybe I might jump a little in those, but normally I just don't jump in horror movies. This movie got me twice. And any horror movie that can manage that, I, you get props from me. And yeah, you say set film like the 70s, you seen that in a good way or a bad way? Um, it just reminded me very much of like The Exorcist, the way it was filmed. It was almost like it was filming uh, very dark and gritty. And it almost it just looks shot in the in the seventies. Was it was it supposed to take place back in the maybe the late night seventies or or like around the eighties? Well, they're using smartphones, so I certainly hope. Oh, that. okay. I mean, no, I just, <laughs> I, you know, no, no. I'm it's, sure if it was true. if it was a quote unquote period piece or that's why or we they just kept, kind of filmed it that way to maybe for effect. That's why we were kind of looking at each other, my daughter and I, wondering is this done for an effect or what? Because it's an odd choice. To film it in the style because it does look very much like a seventies movie, but hmm. regardless, it was it was fairly atmospheric and it worked more than it didn't. So overall, the film works more than it than it didn't, like I said. But despite some very clunky dialogue in spots, and I do mean that very clunky, I originally was going to give it a five five and a half, but as this is a rare horror film that actually got under my skin a few times, I'll give it a six out of ten. Hmm. It's it's worth. I think it's more of a rental um, than it is go to the theater and pay. Pay full price for it, but yeah, but would it have made you jump at home? No, well, I don't know. I mean, it, there wasn't packed. There wasn't that many people there. I mean, yeah. it's Labor Day weekend. Nobody goes to the theater on Labor Day weekend except me, because <laughs> you bitches are watching football. <laughs> Scott, you saw VHS, and we did talk about ad nauseum last week. So, if you want to hear the full description of the film, go listen to that. But you weren't yeah. able to join us because you were home faking sick. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I actually did watch it with with the guys here. So, um, I just wanted to say a quick mention of it because. Um, I actually really – this is one of those movies that is really hard to recommend. I, it's a movie that I want people to see, but I'm not going to recommend it, if that makes sense. There are so many little nuances in the, in the little stories that went through it that I think really need to be seen. But the wrap-up and, and how, how it ends up is just not satisfying at all. Um, uh, but there's just so much cool stuff that they do with it that I found really interesting. I think it's worth a watch. I gave it a 6 out of $10. So, oh, so, so you did like it. Kind of, so it's kind of like one of those drinks that you take, and you're like, oh, this tastes pretty bad. Here, try it. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> you want them to experience it, too. Well, and not, not quite not to that recommending effect. it because it's such a great movie. If, if, like you guys kind of said on, on last week, I, I wish that, that it were just the stories themselves. Like, I felt like the overall story that it had was, was trying to tie it together somehow, and that's, that story was so unsatisfying, although the effects and stuff in that last scene were really freaking cool and, and mm-hmm. genuinely creepy, but they didn't make any, it didn't make any sense. Um, no, it I, just ended. It just, it just, just ended. ended abruptly. It was one of the most uh, abrupt endings and unsatisfying endings I've seen in a long time, and thankfully I was kind of expecting that because I was like, there's no way. There, there's, they're going to explain <laughs> this at all. So I, I didn't go into it with a lot of um, expectations on that front, but... That said, watch the movie. Just don't expect great things in the ending. But there are some very cool steps along the way. I'm telling you, if you got a bunch of guys sitting around or girls, you know, whoever's in the horror movies, your group of friends. Yeah, that's a fun movie to watch with your friends. It is. Of all the movies that we could have done that skyping or watching together, mm-hmm. I can't think of a better one. Like recently, that that was a lot of fun to do. Exactly. So. Well, 2016, Obama's America. We normally don't. We try to stay out of politics because honestly. I'll get angry. Scott will walk away, and Brian will will you know he's got a Confederate flag somewhere. <laughs> so, <laughs> but before we get to what I thought about 2016's Obama, 2016 Obama's America, I thought I'd have a really bad impersonation of Obama himself tell you what the movie's about. Oh boy! My fellow Americans, it has come to my attention that Dinesh D'Souza has made a documentary about me. He has decided to inform the American people about my anti-colonial ties. He thinks I don't care about the American people. Dinesh wants to show you, Americans, that everything I am is because of my father. Well, I'm here to tell you, he's wrong. Dinesh doesn't know me any more than he knows your family. He just hopes to. He hopes to change your mind about me. He'll throw out a few facts and a lot of conjecture. What you decide is up to you, America. Do you want to believe this crazy Indian import or me? Barack Obama, the President of the United States of Canada. I mean America. You decide. I hope you don't change your mind about me. Man, why don't you tell the American people what you thought about this film? I'm going to go over here, play some Rick James, and hopefully convince all of you what a cool black man I truly am. (laughs) 
<laughs> it's like a fast talking oh. Dr. Phil. <laughs> You're welcome. Yeah. <laughs> All right, well, before I review the movie, I think we should be, since it is a very political movie, you can't really deny that. I should be very clear on what my politics are. Mm-hmm. I am a mo- not, I'm not going to go into a ad nauseum. I'm a moderate. People say pick a side. I say no. I like to think for myself. I don't care for many of Obama's policies, but I think he's a very good and decent man. So, fair enough. And I know where I stand. I'm not a hater, not a lover. I didn't want to see this movie because I don't like propaganda at all. Fahrenheit 911 I thought was entertaining, but it's a prime example. I loathed Bush. But it's really hard for me to take that film seriously because it's the whole thing is so slanted. I mean, you know, he has an agenda the entire movie. It's hard to say, well, this is an unbiased film because your whole point is to make me hate him. Mm-hmm. This movie, 2016 was getting a lot of traction. So I said, okay, fine, I'll go see it. Because some people were telling me it's a, it's a fair look at the president. That's what I heard people say. It's not. There, it, it's a very slanted movie, just like Fahrenheit 911 was. There's a lot of truth in here, and I agree with much of what Dinesh has to say on some issues. The things I agree with, I do think you cannot discount Obama's past allegiances and the friends he's kept to say how he feels America should look. But I also think it's insane to make some of the leaps that Dinesh makes in the film because of those associations. Mm-hmm. I mean, he basically, the whole film tries to paint Obama as a radical, which I don't agree with some of his policies, and I think he might lean a certain way, but I don't think he's a radical. I won't go into every theory in the film because it would take way too long. But the primary one is that Dinesh pr- provides his version of evidence to the theory that Obama is a crusading anti-colonialist because that is what his father wanted. Essentially, Dinesh thinks that Obama wants the top 1% to take care of everyone else on a global scale. So basically, affirmative action for the entire world. That's basically what anti-colonialism is. He wants the top 1% to take care of everybody. He doesn't he wants to level the playing field. Um if he just stuck with facts and steered the ship that way, the film could have been very, very powerful. I believe that. But instead, it, it seems like about two thirds of the way movie, or two thirds of the way through the movie, the whole thing just changes. Dinesh begins to subtly attack Obama, and the whole thing becomes a giant campaign ad for Romney or whoever won the nomination. Uh, so I was with him up until this point, but because he was presenting facts and he was making informed opinions up to that point. Then he started digressing into what his psychological his psychological analysis BS was of the stuff that he had presented already. So he's trying to say, well, because of this and because of this, that's why he thinks that. But he has no real evidence to support that. It's mm-hmm. his opinion. I don't want to see a movie full of opinions. You know, I can get that shit on Fox News or CNN. I wanted, I wanted to see a, a documentary where you present facts and I establish my own opinion. That's what happens the first two-thirds of the movie, stops happening, and then for the last third becomes a campaign ad. So I'm telling you, if I already don't like Obama's policies, I agree with several points in the film. I do feel Obama has damaged our deficit more than Bush, leans a little too close to socialism, and still tell you this movie is skewed fluff. I think you should take my word for it. It's you're you're not gonna feel any different about Obama than you did before you walked into that theater. If you were a fan walking in, you're gonna feel reaffirmed about being a fan. If you're a hater, you're gonna hate him some more. That's really all the movie does. And I cannot I cannot condone nor encourage people to see something that evolves into a psychological attack on a sitting U.S. president. I think it's wrong. Um, do I understand it? Sure. I thought Fahrenheit 911 was really entertaining, really poor idea to make because. It's so far out there. And I think this also so far out there. Facts, I'm all for. I'll watch that any day. But this loose psychological crap, it's just not fair enough. I just I just couldn't buy it. So hmm. if $10 is the full price of admission, this one's worth 4 bucks. Wow. Do you guys have questions about it? Anything? Not even one. Well, you hate politics. Brian, do you have questions about it? Well, you, you pretty much answered it. I was just, what I was curious about was how how skewed it was. Is how I guess how obvious how obvious is it to see that it's somebody with an agenda that's making it uh, much like the Michael Moore just about every Michael Moore movie. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, some of them are like you say some of them are entertaining, but you can't watch that and and take that as complete truth. No, you can't. You have to remember that throughout right, the whole right. film. You just because everything's kind of cut in there and put in there in a certain way to make you to give you certain thoughts about whoever the subject is. So the the real sad part is he's a Dinesh is an intellectual. He really is an intellectual. I mean, he's a very established uh, person. You can you can look up his credentials. He's a very he? Dinesh D'Souza. He's a he's a, an established um, philosopher. You know, theoretical whatever he is. He's a very smart guy. He went he went to uh, Dartmouth College. I mean, he's a smart guy. And if 
And he presents himself much better than, say, a Michael Moore does because Michael Moore is so loudmouthed and rambunctious and in your face. You know what I mean? D'Souza doesn't do that. He's he's very calm. He's very sweet, well-mannered. It means that he seems like a very nice guy. More, peop more people would appreciate his point of view if he didn't spend the last third of the movie ramming it down your throat with what his opinion is. Because mm -hmm. the first two-thirds, I honestly would say that I felt like, okay, now you're getting me into, on board to what, what your theory is. I kind of see where you're going. I, all right. I agree with because there's certain things. I agree with that. I agree with that. I agree with that. And I'm not going to go into what I agree and don't agree with because I'm – you know, people hate the show because we're being political and I don't want to be that. Uh, email me, I'll tell you. Um, <laughs> but but then the last third, it just goes into Michael Moore territory. He doesn't get any louder. He doesn't get louder and but just his – he definitely goes for his, appoint, his point of view of the last third of the movie and ramming it down our throats. And I just – that turned me off completely. Turned mm. me off completely. The people that are saying that this is a, a fair representation and – you know, now you're going to get to know Obama much better. You really don't. I mean, he spends so much time trying to connect who his father was to who he is that it's it's just disturbing. It's it's really disturbing because – and I, I understand that because I come from a person – you know, I didn't have my father around when I was growing up. So I understand what it's like to try to, to, try to aspire to what you think your father would want you to be. But I also know how that feels and I, what he's saying isn't psychologically accurate. I don't buy it. I think he's making some giant leaps. Hmm. Do you wonder if uh, President Obama went to the theater and saw this? Hell no, he didn't go see it. <laughs> he's too busy doing our fucking podcast, didn't you hear? <laughs> he's still over sitting over there in the corner. He is. What's up, Bo? <laughs> <laughs> um, remember, you can always subscribe to The Hollywood Outsider on our site, iTunes, Stitcher Radio, or anywhere else you can find an RSS feed. And you can listen to us on RockfordCollegeRadio.com every Thursday from 4 to 6. Box office. The Possession had the second best Labor Day opening ever with $17.7 million. Lawless with Shia LaBeouf, I'm obscuring from big Hollywood films, opened at just a hair over $10 million. So Shia will be apologizing and begging Michael Bay for another job in no time. <laughs> Oogie Loves. Oogie Loves. Had the worst, the worst wide opening in history with $444,000 and a $206 per, dollar per theater average. That's about three tickets sold per showing. Good job, America. Good job. <laughs> that, that's insane. That's ridiculous. I mean, in history, history, the worst wide opening ever. Yeah. Three tickets sold. I mean, you, you'd think they'd give away more than that. How much did that movie cost to make? Uh, $20 million, $40 million to promote. So that's $60 million bucks. Holy crap. It technically crap. had to make about 80 before it started breaking even. Wow. Wow. So somebody... Is fired. What was the number one best Labor Day movie ever? Uh, was Halloween. The original Halloween? No, the remake. Oh, the remake. Of Halloween, yeah. yep. Interesting. And also Dark Knight Rises eclipsed its its last big um, obstacle. The Dark Knight, pass, uh, Dark Knight Rises passed Dark Knight with $1 billion worldwide. So both of those movies made $1 billion worldwide, but Dark Knight Rises has officially passed Dark Knight. Hmm. So Christian Bale, if he wants Robert Downey Jr. Jr. money, he needs to call Warner Brothers now. And offer up a Justice League or something. Hey, out of, just out of curiosity, but we you know didn't really mention this or anything. But I know um, they released the Avengers over Labor Day weekend to try to surpass Titanic. Yeah, do you know? Do you know if they ever did or they did release it for one week only? It just made a couple million bucks. It's it's gonna go nowhere near it. Yeah. Gotcha. But I'll bet you I wouldn't be surprised, Brian, if in the near future they released it again. With some added stuff, just to try to juice that number up. Maybe around yeah. the re release of the. Well, no, that would make sense. Around the release oh, of the no, box set, they would probably do it in a couple years. Well, the box set comes out in a couple of weeks. Uh, actually, they postponed it. So if you're delayed. getting that big giant box set from Marvel, you're gonna have to wait because. And they said indefinitely, no, no, for sure sight when it's coming, right? Yep. Loki. Now, is, that, is, is that just a box set, or is that the movie itself? Like. No, that's just the box set. The big box set, oh, okay. yeah. Don't phase worry. One. If you got the regular one, you'll be okay. Phase one, I think it's called. Isn't yeah, it? it's phase one. Now it's time for... Justin's Upcoming Attractions. Justin's Upcoming Attractions with Scott Clark. <laughs> yeah, sorry, Justin can't make it this week, so I'm going to do my best to do this justice. Um, obviously, I'm not nearly as clever as Justin, the, you the, sure are. the writer, so... 
Um, but we got a couple of releases here that are coming out, actually three releases that are coming out on uh, the weekend of September 14th. The first is The Master. This comes from dir- <laughs> <laughs> This comes from director Paul Thomas Anderson, who is uh, best known for There Will Be Blood in Magnolia. Um, this story here is, after returning from the Second World War, having witnessed many horrors, a charismatic intellectual creates a faith-based organization in an attempt to provide meaning to his life. He becomes known as The Master. His right-hand man, a former drifter, begins to question both the belief system and the master as the organization grows and gains a fervent following. This stars Philip Seymour Hoffman, Joaquin Phoenix, and Amy Adams, and this will be a very limited release movie. Now, Aaron, you being the uh, Catholic that Justin thinks you are, must find interest in a film about questioning a belief system. (laughs) Is this a film you're going to be boogieing on down to see or no? Uh, Wow, nice. Really? You like that? Yeah, I like that. Nice. Nice try it, Justin. (laughs) Um, I'm really disappointed because I kind of thought this was a remake of The Last Dragon when I read it. I, I kind of thought they were going to go with that route, but who is the master? Uh, show uh, enough. See? Show enough. <laughs> uh, I have no desire to see it. I don't like Paul Thomas Anderson. I just don't care about Magnolia. I like Boogie Nights. The rest of his filmography borders me to tears. I like Magnolia, and I can't tell you why. Because of Tom Cruise. Yeah, he was awesome in that. But I mean, I've I watched that whole thing from front to back several times. It's one of those movies that makes no sense, has no plausible storyline, but I enjoyed watching it. It's they're artistic. His movies will get huge critics ratings. They will love him. He'll probably get six Oscars, and I still could care less. Yeah. It's just he just I just don't yeah I just don't get it. I mean, yeah. it's getting a lot of buzz, and anything with Philip Seymour Hoffman usually does. Mm-hmm. You know, and. The critics also love Joaquin Phoenix for some reason. I don't, I don't get that either. I fell off that bandwagon ever since that publicity stunt he did. Yeah, he's a weird dude. He's a weird dude. Yeah. So, but I I agree with you. I I like Boogie Nights. I liked uh, There Will Be Blood. But Magnolia and Punch Drunk Love, I just, I didn't like either one of those. Just, I don't know. This movie itself looks kind of good though. I, it didn't do anything for me at all. Didn't do anything for me. I'm holding off for the Last Dragon remake. Sorry, B. I like it. (laughs) I like if I like a good movie about cults. Okay, <laughs> just okay. saying. Good to know. Well, if they're horror movies, it doesn't, it doesn't make sense for a d- drama. You never know. Feel like Seymour just, Hoffman just think, go crazy. Just think Red State without a whole lot of action violence. or interesting things happening. Red State was awesome. Yeah. All right. Uh, next up, re-releases of older movies in the theater with a 3D rehaul aren't a new concept as of late, uh, and Finding Nemo 3D is the newest addition to this formula. So for those who missed the 2003 release, Finding Nemo follows Marlin, a timid clownfish who sets out on a journey to bring his son home after he's captured in the Great Barrier Reef and taken to Sydney. Now, Brian, you're like me and you don't have any kids to take this movie to see as an excuse. Are you going to fight the current and go see this one anyway, or are you going to avoid looking like Aaron walking into the theater? (laughs) I'll give you credit. You're doing just as good as Justin. I'll give you some credit. (laughs) You know, when I heard about this, first I was like, whoa. And then I was like, whoa. And then I was like, whoa. whoa. <laughs> <laughs> so I love this movie. I I don't know if I'll go to the you know to the theater and see it in three D though, but it may make me break out the uh the movie and put it in the old Blu ray player. So <laughs> when it comes out on Blu ray? No. I've got it up yep. Yeah, I've got it on at least D V D, if not Blu ray, so I've got it in a house somewhere. Did we have so. this argument that it wasn't on yeah, Blu ray? It's not on Blu ray yet. It's but on it DVD. will be. It will be. My, my thing still, is, it, it still looks great on 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 DVD. So it oh, it does. Matter to me. But uh, it's one I can't wait to see in high definition. It depends on if this one is in IMAX or not. Is I this one of your favorite? It's one of the, my favorites in the Pixar. I mean, between is that and Monsters Inc. and um, and Toy Story, obviously, it's especially yeah, it, that one in high definition. There. I can't wait to see how that looks in high definition. The blue and the and the the ripple effects and stuff. That's just got to look gorgeous in blue in high def. I think it'll look great. I won't see it. Yeah, I'll go. I've, I do have the DVD. I'll watch that again because I kind of want to see it again now. But yeah, I don't need to see fish coming at me. I'm, I'm not worried about the 3D. I'm more worried about the, the high def. But uh, I, of course, the 3D underwater that'd be kind of cool too. Yeah, fishies yeah. swimming yeah. in my head. I kind of wish I had like a niece or nephew or something I could take to it and take it to have some fun with it. With it. <laughs> just just to have a reason to <laughs> wait. What? <laughs> Keep moving. You no, sounded like so, me. No, I'm being sincere. Like, like a, I don't know. Take like my a, daughter. Go ahead. Knock yourself out. <laughs> yeah. She's legal. Or she, so. or she might knock yourself out. Yeah. <laughs> she probably would. Yeah. All right. Last up, we've got uh, Resident Evil Retribution. 
Uh, this is the fifth entry in the apparently successful Resident Evil film series starring Mia y- Jovovich. I have trouble pronouncing her name, apparently. Uh, Michelle Rodriguez also reappears in the movie, which is uh, directed by Paul W.S. Anderson. As for the story, the Umbrella Corporation's deadly T-virus continues to ravage the Earth, transforming the global population into legions of the flesh eating undead. The human race's last and only hope, Alice, awakens in the heart of Umbrella's most clandestine operations facility and unveils more of her mysterious past as she delves further into the complex. Now, it's well known that I'm the avid gamer of the group, mm-hmm. uh, and I'm finding, but I'm finding this uh, hard to look at as anything but a violent cash-in on a video game series that I used to love when I was a kid. Um, Aaron, I, I know you're... <laughs> are you going to slowly lumber towards the theater to catch this zombie flick, or do you really? want to fire a rocket launcher into this mess like I do? <laughs> wow, you're really reaching with that one. <laughs> um, okay, my daughter loves Resident Evil. That's probably one of her favorite series. She loves Michelle Rodriguez. I swear. And you mean she, movies or the, the movies? Okay. Yeah, she doesn't play games. Um, Michelle Rodriguez, she loves too. I'll, this is one of the series that I always go with her to see when it opens in the theater, so I'm sure I'll go see this one too. Uh, obviously, I'm going for Father of the Year because it's rated R and it's violent. But basically, when you read that whole description, all I heard was Mila Jovovich shoots more fucking zombies. Yeah. That's really all it is. Mm-hmm. But the last one actually surprised me with how fun it was, even though everything about it was awful. So I'll probably go see it. I didn't really realize there was five of them. Like, <laughs> oh, there'll be six, too. Trust yeah, me, man. Yeah. This movie is huge. This series is huge overseas. It's not really big. It's huge here. But it made like, I think it was $230 million overseas just the last movie did. Yeah. I kind of liked the first one. And it just went downhill for, from that for me. Because the, the, the movie series just isn't anything about what the game series was about to me. Mm-hmm. No, it's, it's name, you know, name only. That's about it. And it's, but the last one, it was fun, but it was, it was distracting because I don't even know if, if they were even on a, on an actual set at any time. Literally. Everything, everything looked CG. Yeah, it does. Every, just everything. You're so, right. I, it, it, so it was a little bit distracting, but it was, they are fun. I don't love them, but they are fun movies. And, and I, I don't know. I usually wait for, uh, for Blu-ray for these things to come out. Especially if they're all CG, it probably look better on high def anyway, right? I don't yeah. know. The 3D was pretty good in the last one. Was it? So, yeah. All right. Well, that one, as well as the other two, are going to all be released on September 14th. Okay. So what are our picks of the week, Scott? <laughs> You're really falling, man. Really? You can't keep up with your job? <laughs> so we've got choices between Resident Evil Retribution, Finding Nemo 3D, or The Master. Which of these are you going to pick, Aaron? I'm going to pick Resident Evil Retribution. So is Justin, because that's his little series. All right. What about you, Brian? I'm going to go with my namesake, the master. <laughs> really? <laughs> Jesus. Wow. I'm going to go with Finding Nemo. Ooh, so it's a split. I'm, I'm willing to see a nine-year-old movie over, over the other two. That's fair enough. Uh, what's this movie? Okay. What's this movie? Each week we play a clip from a movie. This could be our choice or our listeners if you want to suggest one. If you think you know what the clip is, email us at feedback at thehollywoodoutsider.com or send us a direct message on Twitter at H underscore outsider, and we will announce those that get it correct on the air. As well, we will draw a name from those that guess correctly and send them an official I'm a whole Hollywood Outsider t-shirt. Last week's answer was my choice, and it was The Crow. And there was a lot of wrong answers, including a lot of Watchmen. So I don't... Hmm. That's why I added the Watchmen question, so I could, I don't know. Say make fun of people. Thanks, not make fun of them. Like say, them thank you for them. responding. <laughs> but the people that got it correct were Ed W., Ashley S., Jesse M., JC, and Barrel House Red. Scott is going to draw the winner, and the winner of the I'm a Ho t-shirt is, drum roll please. Is <laughs> JC. JC. Uh, congratulations. We will be in touch with you to find out where you live. Right now, this is uh, Brian's choice this week, so we're going to play this clip. If you think you know what it is, email us at feedback at com. Those that guess correctly, we're going to draw from the winners next week for a free hoe shirt. Here you go. I just don't like your uterus. Don't get me wrong. Your eggs are in great shape, but you have a T-shaped uterus, and that combined with your advanced maternal age uh, is preventing proper implantation. Why do I have this? T-shaped uterus. Well, it probably has something to do with medication that was given to your mother when she was pregnant with you. We used a lot of drugs back in the 70s, which we now know can cause infertility. Okay. If you think you know what that clip was, email us or tweet us. Uh, let's go on to the couch where we talk about TV and home video news. Epics signed a deal with Amazon. 
formerly that content was exclusive, and now uh, it's going to be through Netflix and Amazon. Is this the beginning of the end for Netflix, Brian? You know, I don't, I don't know. It's you know, we did talk about last week about how Apple might be taking over TV, home TV, and we also mentioned a few of the other players like Netflix and Amazon. And you know, I will say that that Epics, I got a, a free preview for Epics, like a three week or a month deal with a with Epics. And I don't know if my channel even ever left it. It was great. They would have every Rocky movie back to back, Transformers, just all these big summer blockbuster, you know, popcorn fest movies. And that's all they show. Hmm. Hmm. And so it was just like, oh my God, this movie's on. Okay, this one's coming up. You know, it was uh, like Cowboys and Aliens, you know, a few of the uh, um, the paranormal activity ones. So it was just just about every movie that, that I like. And hey, that's what all I really care about. <laughs> Fair enough. Well, that's all that content's on, on Netflix right now. So, but this news is really followed up with Amazon's announcement. I guess they got one coming up real soon in the next day or two about their next line of Kindle Fire tablets. So this is going to be a huge boost for Amazon. I don't know if it's going to be quite the nail in, in Netflix's coffin. They have to share it now. It's not like Netflix is not going to lose access to the Epics movies. It's just they're not going to be the only ones who have them now. So oh, okay. That's... There's a, you know, we can get just about you know any movie through any other venue. So I don't think it's really going to kill Netflix, but it does kind of kick in the shin a little bit. Yeah, yeah, it does. Kind of tugs on them a little bit. Yeah, but you're not going to drop your Netflix because of that. You're not losing anything if you're a Netflix subscriber. I'm not. It's eight bucks a month. I don't care. I mean, and I, I've tried to use the Amazon service, and I don't like it as much. I don't think it's as user friendly. Mm-hmm. Me personally, I mean, maybe other people love it. I don't know, but. I just prefer Netflix. The ease, it's it's available on every device I have, and it right. works simplistic. So, yeah, I, I'm I'm going to stick with Netflix, Amazon. I'll still buy all your shit, though. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you, Amazon Prime shipping. Oh, oh God, God, I love it. Um, okay, it's no more talk. Eddie Murphy and S.H.I.E.L.D. creator Sean Ryan are bringing Beverly Hills Cap to CBS as a pilot, possibly a series. Eddie Murphy will reprise his role of Axel Foley, but after the pilot, he would take a backseat to his son, Aaron, which is a fantastic fucking name. <laughs> Disagree, but I, I got I to gotta be a quick note because I don't know, Brian, I don't know if you know this, but Aaron's ringtone on his phone whenever I call him is the is the Axel F theme. Mm-hmm. Oh, for, no, nice. for no reason for whatsoever. For no reason whatsoever. So like whenever I call, dun, 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 dun. it just makes me laugh. Yeah. I don't know so, why. Apparently I'm hey, Axel Foley and- to Aaron. Real quick, do you know you, th- you two clowns know that Sean Ryan is from Rockford? I did know that. Yep. I didn't? Okay. Yep. He's from Rockford, Illinois. He never acknowledges it, and I don't blame him. <laughs> His uh, Twitter icon is a map of Illinois with Rockford at the top oh, of it. Oh, well, then I guess I'm wrong. Yeah, he acknowledges <laughs> it. <laughs> really, that's acknowledging it quite well. Yeah, it is. <laughs> I mean, this this sounds pretty like uh, it could be a good idea. I, I think Eddie Murphy was the big appeal of the series, though. And if he's only going to be in the pilot, I don't know anybody that's going to follow that shadow well enough to carry the Beverly Hills Cop name. <laughs> I mean, let's be honest. <laughs> unless unless he's doing an imitation, and then it's not going to be funny if if Eddie Murphy's in the in the pilot. That's not crazy funny black guy. Oh, that's that's not been done before. Come on, you're right. Okay, you're you're agreeing with me. I thought yeah. you were saying that. No, like, I'm agreeing with you. Yeah, yeah. I. I I don't even think Eddie Murphy can still do it, let, <laughs> let alone a new kid. Not without a fat suit on. Oh, gee. <laughs> <laughs> Touche. You, the fact, the you know, the fact that Sean Ryan is involved with it does give me a little more faith in it. But how much can really go wrong in Beverly Hills that a blue-collar detective from Detroit has to be the only one that can save the day? Well, hello. They keep falling for the banana in the tailpipe. <laughs> <laughs> I'll go rewatch those movies now. The first one's hilarious. The second one's not bad. The third one is one of the worst sequels of all time. Yeah? Yeah. It's up there with Superman 4. Yeah, it's it's freaking horrible. I actually paid in the theater. I'm still mad about that. <laughs> I want my $4 back. I want my $4. <laughs> um, let's go on to the DVD and Blu-rays. Scotty, what's coming out? All right, this is for the week of 9-11. I don't know how to say that. <laughs> Scott got really sad just saying a date. <laughs> First up, uh, Snow White and the Huntsman. This is a twist on a classic story where the Huntsman, who's sent to destroy Snow White, becomes her protector. This stars Kristen Stewart, Chris Hemsworth, and Charlie Theron. Uh, next up is What to Expect When You're Expecting. Uh, in this movie, five interconnected couples experience the thrills and surprises of having a baby that I will never experience. 
Uh, for <laughs> for greater glory, okay. this is a chronicle of the true story of the Christeros War, which took place between 1926 and 1929, which pitted the people of Mexico against the atheistic Mexican government. Uh, finally, Girl in Progress follows uh, Ava Mendez as a single mother dealing with her daughter, who's trying to grow up too quickly. Also on TV series Castle's uh, fourth season is available. Woohoo! Uh, Big Bang Theories season five. Woohoo! <laughs> and uh, Vampire Diaries season three. If my wife could hear you, she'd woohoo. Okay. <laughs> she watches that show religiously. It's it's sick. Really? Yeah, she yeah. loves it. Yeah. Loves it. But I'm she sure also loves. Re- but she also loves Big Bang Theory. So I got it. She does. She, gotta, she just likes thoughts. Castle. She dislikes Castle? No, she just likes it. Oh, okay. She doesn't love it at all. Oh, okay. She loves Big Bang Theory. She can watch that over and over and over and over. And she does, doesn't she? <laughs> yeah, she does, kind of. Yeah. yeah. Ooh, yeah. Hit me with that unknown shit. Flashback. All right, with that, we'll move on to our flashback DVD Blu-ray seg- segment. This is where uh, each week one of our hosts recommends a little-known or obscure film that we hope you'll give a chance. This week it's actually my turn, so I've got a movie that I actually watched last night that I've been meaning to see for quite a while, and I'm really excited to talk to you about it. Wizard Obviously, of Oz. <laughs> Wizard of Oz. <laughs> Citizen Kane. I've never seen that one. What happens? <laughs> no, I mean, in, in one of the things we, we say, either older or, or, or a little obscure, this one's not old. This actually came out uh, this year. It's fine, let alone or obscure. Yeah, it's, it's, a, it's a, actually an independent uh, documentary on, on the, obviously, my favorite pastime which is video games he says this like he's he, he looks if you guys could see him it would be even better because he looks like he's walking in admitting he's a pedophile he's just like <laughs> you know my my favorite pastime my well opening. you gotta understand man i've been a gamer my whole life i've been made fun of being a gamer for my entire life and this movie was so awesome because it's exactly what i'm looking for and i'll explain why the, the movie's called indie game the movie it uh it basically follows three different development teams of indie games now an indie game for those that aren't familiar with it much like an indie movie, is a, is a game that's created by a smaller group of people. In this case, these three games are created by uh, either one or two different members that are doing all of the programming, all of the marketing, all of everything. Well, I mean, the publisher is doing a lot of the mm-hmm. marketing, obviously, but all of the legwork for creating the game is done by one or two guys, which if you think of teams like Activision and well, Activision's a publisher, but like Epic and this kind of things that have hundreds of guys doing these these okay. things, this is a really interesting introspective on it. First off, I've always wanted a way to show people why I love gaming so much. Mm-hmm. I can never really explain it. And the first half of this documentary really does that in a way that works for me. These guys are about my age and grew up in the same grew up on the same video games that I played as a kid. They've got the exact passion that I have for what I consider to be my favorite uh, pastime or hobby. With that said, it's something that I've that that alone makes me want to recommend the movie because it explains why I love what I love to do so much in a way that, that like these guys are just, just as passionate about it as I am, except they took it a step further instead of just playing the games and actually are making the games because they're very artistic and they're, and they're doing a really good job with it. Um, what really makes it interesting though, is just what goes on in these guys day to day lives, because you're talking about three different, de- three different development teams, three games. You may or may not have heard of them, but one is called braid as an XBLA title uh, made by a guy named Jonathan blow. A uh, game called Fez, which was created by Phil Fish. This was actually released this past year. And lastly, Super Meat Boy, which I talked about mm-hmm. a lot, um, was done by Edmund McMillan and Tommy uh, R- Rafenis. I don't know if I'm pronouncing his name correctly, but these guys literally sit at their computers for 12 to 15 hours a day, writing code, tweaking in these kind of things, doing what hundreds of guys do in a big budget title. And, and it's just it's exhausting to see. They're going through stressful... Uh, I, I can't even express how the the different traumatic things they go through in this that makes it really interesting it sounds totally boring to to see these guys sitting in a computer screen but t- there's a lot of politics going on one guy's lost a partner and is waiting for a signature so he can even show this game at, a, at an expo mm-hmm. um some of these guys are up late at night um waiting to see if their game is released that kind of thing it's it's extremely interesting and and um there's, what, what, what's really funny is a couple of these guys, you watch this and you think he might not have wanted to say that on camera, talking about some of the, d- the developers and some of the publishers that they're actually working for. Mm-hmm. It, it, it's, it's pretty interesting. So um, it, it puts in perspective the work that has to be done to make a, a video game that we're paying 12 bucks for as opposed to one that we're paying 60 bucks for. And these guys are basically going out of their minds, and it's very entertaining to watch. Can't recommend it enough. I, I really... Hope you guys will will give it a shot. It's called Indie Game. Indie Game, the movie. And Scott is just just five seconds short of having an orgasm. <laughs> <laughs> All 
Seriously, I think we would have held out just a little longer. It's it's one of those. A mess, wouldn't you? The, the the first third or first half of the movie is just a love letter to why these guys love games. I mean, it's it, it it's. We get it. We get it. Somebody man. gets we it. Get it, man. We don't want to go like an hour and a half on an indie game. All right. Okay. Now, <laughs> if you want to see it, it's if, available if you like on games. There you go. Yeah, you can download it on iTunes. It's like a, like a four dollar rental or something like that. Okay. Stump the hoe answer. You guys ready? You want to find out who was right and who was the. Uh, the question was, the possessions Jeffrey Dean Morgan starred in the critically adored comic book adaptation Watchmen. For whatever reason, the film's first trailer remains one of the most popular of all time, yet only two characters actually speak throughout the entire trailer. Morgan's comedian is one who is the other. Was it Dr. Manhattan, Rorschach, Night Owl, or Silk Spectre? Scott said Dr. Manhattan. Brian correctly guessed Rorschach. Ah. And what he said was, the world will look up and shout, save us, and I'll whisper, No. That's all he says in the trailer. And the comedian says, I, God damn us or something like that. I don't remember. I do remember that now, yeah. Um, Let's go to our From the Outside In topic this week. This week, we're having our summer movie wrap-up. And summer is basically May through August releases. Uh, We're going to talk about what we thought about this year's crop of films as well as what our favorite picks are for a couple little categories. So we're not going to go as in-depth as we do Oscar time, but we're going to go into a little bit. So first off, what did you think of this year's summer's crop versus last year's summer? I, I got to be honest. You know, this is the first summer that I had where I was on a movie podcast. Mm-hmm. You know, I mean, well, the first one that I that I was a lo- a far along the way don't, in a movie podcast. Don't worry, but it'll be the last one. <laughs> <laughs> it, that said, it makes me a little. It makes me somewhat jaded because I go to I go to a lot more movies now as opposed to last summer or summers past where I was seeing seeing. Um, Few just, and far between ones that I that I was super stoked for. You know what I mean? Um, this one felt to me not as I wasn't as excited for this summer as I was in, in past summers. But there were a couple that were really awesome, especially mm-hmm. one in particular that no yeah. surprise was a, a, a was a big was it was a big surprise to me how much I liked it. Um, but I just wasn't that super excited every weekend going into it. If that makes sense. I think in, in past summers it became the thing I was looking forward to in the weekends is what's coming out, mm-hmm. and nothing seemed to just like I absolutely have to see that movie except for maybe three or four weekends of the summer. What about you guys? I agree. I think honestly, too many comic book movies this year, uh, too many sequels, too many raunchy comedies that weren't good, not nearly enough adult dramas, topical movies, things to to make the summer stand out and be a little different. I mean, it's just, I like variety. There's mm-hmm. a lot of the same old thing. Throughout the summer, there's a lot of good movies, but there weren't very many great movies, mm-hmm. and that's really what stands out. Usually, you have those little sleeper hits, where you know it comes out, you don't think it's going to be a big movie. A lot of people see it, start talking about it, becomes like a phenomenon. The Help was one that was one last year. It became a huge uh, phenomenon. A great movie. Yeah, and and there's a lot of movies like that. There weren't really that many this year. I mean, The Avengers, obviously, um, Ted. Surprised a lot of people, but outside of that, it was a lot of repetition, man. A lot of sequels, a lot of the same old thing. I mean, they're Spider Man. They rebooted a origin story from ten years ago. Even the Pixar movie was just yeah. Brave didn't really catch many catch many people off off track. What about you, B? As far as name recognition goes, this is probably one of the biggest summers ever. Mm-hmm. I mean, you had Avengers, Snow White, Battleship. Dark Knight, Spider Man, Men in Black Three, Expendables, Jason Bourne, sort of, and Ice Age. I mean, that's for a to pack them in within just a couple of months of each other. That's that's a pretty big summer. Not that saying that all of them were good, mm-hmm. or even let's just say lived up to what the, you know the expectations or the hype. Um, you know, there was some of a uh, some did exceed expectations however high or small they might have been. And there was, like I said, there were some others that, that didn't. But it was a, I personally think it was a pretty sick, pretty good summer. Uh, there are, you know, they're usually, like I say, there, there usually is one movie that really stands out over the summer. Um, but I thought overall, I thought it was a pretty good, I thought it was a pretty good summer. It's, it's, it's one of those where there's more, there was more to look forward to this summer because there was something almost every single week that for one reason or another, I pretty much wanted to see. Yeah, I see what you're saying. Well, the top summer movies, top five summer movies this year, 
Marvel's The Avengers with $620 million. That's ridiculous. Uh, the Dark Knight Rises made $433 million so far. The Amazing Spider-Man with $259 million, which is actually way down from the previous films, but it did about the same overseas, so it's still a hit. Brave with $232 million. And Ted with two hundred and sixteen, a foul mouth fucking teddy bear, made two hundred and sixteen million dollars. That's that's phenomenal. So we're gonna start with a couple categories. Our first one is what was our favorite performance, the fav, the best performance to us from all the actors working, uh, from all the films over the summer. I get to go first. My, well, I would like to give an honorable mention to Channing Tatum's thong and Magic Mike. <laughs> Because, damn, that thing just shit. Pick one, damn it. <laughs> um, but the winner of my favorite performance is Charlize Theron in Snow White and the Huntsman. I think she, as the evil queen, just that's the one performance that I can say blew me away. I was, she, If it wasn't for her, that movie would have went so far down in mm. my liking scale. Um, so very, very impressed. And the performance is still stuck with me. In fact, they were talking about a sequel. And I can't think of even seeing the sequel unless she's in it somehow. Hmm. So... Brian, I'm going to go with a with a villain also. Uh, I I agree with you. Charlie Theron was phenomenal, in it, and she really did save that movie. But I'm going to go with Tom Hiddleston, who played Loki in the Avengers. Mm. Okay, I thought he did a just a he. I just basically just thought he did a fantastic job of making you not like him, then you sympathize with him, and then he reverts it back to the just the natural villain that Loki is. So. Yeah, you saw him a lot more in a in a much larger role in the Avengers than you did in Thor. Uh, I just thought he brought one of the many. Just he was just one more aspect to just a a very multifaceted, awesome movie. He so. really just upped the ante ante from uh, from Thor too. Like he was just kind of a mild character. Yeah, in Thor, big time. And then he just where did that come from in Avengers? Yeah, good, good. Yeah, very I mean, as, as, as big as the, the characters and personalities are for the the good side. He really balanced that out with being just a, a big villain mm -hmm. on the other side. So, right. Scott? Mine was uh, Emma Stone as Gwen Stacy in The Amazing Spider-Man. Really You're a shock. You're in love with her. I am. I've had a crush on her since Zombieland. But uh, you know, her, her role, like we talked about the help earlier, kind of solidified her as, a, as an actor. Um, but this took it a step further for me and made, really made her a high-profile actor in my book. I mean, she's, I, I really look forward to seeing what else she's going to do. It was a movie I, I really enjoyed a lot, but she really stole the show in that role. And, and a lot of it had to do with the writing, I'll give you that. But I, I loved her in that movie. I thought she was great. Okay. Oh, cool. breakout actor and actor. Oh, I'm sorry, Brian. Did you want to say something to him? No, I just said cool. Oh. But carry on. <laughs> breakout actor and act or actress, either one. Uh, it's a newer actor on the scene that made us take notice. Brian, what, who's your pick? I'm going to go with Benjamin Walker. Who played Abraham Lincoln and oh, Abe Lincoln? Good Vampire. choice, man. Good choice. He was totally believable as a young Abraham Lincoln, and there were times where he actually—I <laughs> personally thought he looked more like a young Liam Neeson, but I don't know. That's just me, maybe. <laughs> no, um, I agree. But I just, you know, but overall, I just kind of thought he was a—I just thought he did a really good job with with not only carrying the historical aspect of it, but he also pulled off the action. Uh, vampire hunter side of it too. So potential's there for a pretty good career for this guy. Cool. Mine was, and I I apologize, I'm not sure how to pronounce her last name, Julianne who? How? Huff. Huff? Huff. Is it Huff? Julianne Huff yeah. as Julianne uh, Sherry Christian in Rock of Ages. Oh. Um, while she's not brand new to the entertainment scene, and she has been in a couple other movies like Footloose and Burlesque, um, she's just, this girl was just adorable in this movie. She's very, I know we're supposed to do it on acting merit, that kind of thing, but I want to see her in more films. Her character was so damn cute. Um, I think we're starting to see a trend with Scott. Yeah, no, but but that's. A, <laughs> I really want to see her take the acting reins a step further and come out of the musical role a little bit and see what she can do on the acting front. Because mm -hmm. I mean, she really she really owned each screen that she each shot that she was in in the in Rock of Ages, and I'd like to see her do more. Okay, mine was Andrew Garfield as Peter Parker, Amazing Spider-Man. Uh, I I went into it basically saying this movie's going to suck, and he won me over. Yeah, so. I tied uh, with that one. Yeah. Uh, I realized he was in, uh, what was it, uh, Social Network. Thank you. I'm, I'm skittering over my own words. He was in the Social Network, and he was obviously very good in that. But when he got cast in this role, I just started laughing because, like, that dweeby kid 
from Social Network. I just thought he was okay. He's great as Peter Parker. He nailed it. He He's is. better than Tobey Maguire. Uh, I mean, I mean, no, dis, no, no disdain to, to Tobey Maguire. I think he did a, a very good job. He just didn't do a great job. And I think uh, Andrew Garfield nailed it. So uh, really impressed the hell out of me. And I'll, I look forward to anything the guy does from now on. Now, favorite film moment. Scotty. What was your favorite moment from the summer of 2012? I'm really hoping I'm not seeing one of you guys is because this is a pretty pretty easy one. But I don't remember standing up and cheering more than the scene from the Avengers when Hulk beats the crap out of Loki. <laughs> I, seriously, it was so satisfying. I don't, I don't remember anything so cool to see in the theater since Joker's disappearing pencil trick scene from several years ago from The oh. Dark Knight. I mean, that was just... You couldn't even hear the the puny god line because everyone was was cheering and applauding. So yeah, much I didn't even know that line until the second time I saw <laughs> Same it. Same here. I had no idea that was even in there. So that was definitely my favorite film movement, moment of the summer. Brian, oh, <clears throat> you said you came really close to stealing mine because mine also involves the Hulk, but it's when he punches Thor. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> I thought of that one too. Is that what was it? Hulk smash or yeah. something like? That? Yep. Or uh, you know, he just and he bam, he just. He doesn't even look. He just, bam, knocks him off the screen. And it's totally off guard, just totally between that one and the one where he attacks Loki is, uh, you know, they just, they both just catch you off guard. Yeah, the timing was just absolutely hilarious. Timing was perfect. If it would have been like a half a second later, I don't think it would have been as funny. Mm -hmm. Uh, Yeah. Uh What about you, Aaron? Well, I'm not one of you bitches. I didn't just jump on the Avengers bandwagon, this whole (laughs) thing. But um, mine is actually... uh, and I tried really hard to, to think to like just narrow it down to a piece, but it's the entire opening scene to Expendables two. It's oh. about ten minutes, fifteen minutes, Brian, whatever it is. But that ten that opening is everything I ever wanted to see in an action movie. <laughs> and and the opening to the movie. Like basically if that movie would have ended when that opening ended, I was fine. I could have walked away. <laughs> would you agree, B? I mean, you know what I'm saying? No, absolutely. It was a, just a great opening, just and it really highlighted every single one of them. Yeah, and, and what they do best, and a few extra, you know, a few seconds and everything. It was a lot of action, a lot of just crazy action. So, yeah, ridiculous. My favorite time. I mean, seriously, I was so giddy. I was almost, I almost wanted to stand up the whole time that scene was playing. Kind of wish I could have seen you see that movie now. Oh god, that was like a kid in a candy <laughs> score. Uh, okay, let's go to the worst movie moment. The the worst moment in a film in the summer. My personal choice was the ending scene in Savages. Unfortunately, I can't tell you exactly what happens, but it's the it's the weakest ending to an otherwise strong film I've seen since No Country for Old Men. How that movie ended just ruined the whole movie for me. Hmm. So, just just awful. Bad choice, Mr. Stone. Bad choice. <laughs> Scotty? <laughs> Mine was the cock pump scene in Magic Mike. Was that really necessary? <laughs> Where the guy's pumping his... Yeah, you don't heart. even realize it's there. Like, all of a sudden, you see this 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 dick just, like, slowly inching in the corner of the screen. And I was like, really? Do we have to have that in the movie? <laughs> <laughs> all right, fair enough. Brian, what's your worst? Wow, I didn't, feel didn't expect so that. inadequate after that. Um, <laughs> mine's actually from Prometheus. And that was the running... When the characters were running away from the rolling spaceship I while that. running directly in the path of it. Yep. <laughs> you got this big giant donut shaped spacecraft that's rolling towards you. And instead of just walking 10 feet to the right or to the left, <laughs> you get smushed. Right. Right. It's like they, Wiley Coyote. You know, they, they roll in the line of, of the roll. So they, they run in the line of the rolling of the, I don't know. It's absolutely ridiculous. It's yeah. smart and, Brilliant as these space scientists are and everything, they couldn't figure that shit out, really. <laughs> okay, the best movie line. What was the best line we've heard all summer? Brian, you get to go first. He's adopted. Oh, <laughs> That's that mine was mine. Too. That was all of ours? <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. That's funny. Just the fact that Thor, with a sense of humor, it's, again, it was just one of those things that you didn't see coming. Very just. He's never, you know, he's never really, he hasn't, He's not familiar with humor. You know, it's Earth is really, I don't know how much humor they have up in Asgard, but, <laughs> you know, it was just, uh, it was just so, it was just so funny. Like, hey, look, here's what he did. Here's what he did. Oh, he's adopted. Yeah. <laughs> and there was so much controversy over that, too. Do you remember? Oh, it was horrible. I don't quite yep. understand why, but, <laughs> you know, there's adopted people are very offended by this sort of thing, apparently. They're <laughs> just people that hate on everything. It's crazy people. 
Um, and basically what they said was, don't speak about Loki. Loki's beyond reason, but he's a Vyaskar and he's my brother. And the guy says, he killed 80 people in two days. He's adopted. Yeah. <laughs> It was awesome. That was awesome. Because, again, you weren't expecting that to come And the fact that we all three picked it without even knowing what each other's answers were, I think that says it all. Absolutely. Okay. Movie that most demands a sequel, Scotty. All right. The easy answer is going to be Avengers, but since we already know that's in the works, I'm going to say Ted. I think you I, want more foul mouth I Teddy want Bear. More, I would want more Ted. I think that if Seth MacFarlane can be making Family Guy episodes for as long as he has, he can make another two-hour movie about a talking Teddy Bear, <laughs> and, it, and it would be funny. <laughs> pretty good, pretty good rationale, I guess. <laughs> okay, uh, mine's gonna be the Amazing Spider-Man. Uh, Avengers, I'm happy with. So if it was only just one and done, I'd be actually be very, very happy with that. Yeah, but I, they've got us. They've got one <clears throat> in the works already. Yeah, I get that, but what I'm what I'm saying is sequels always concern me because if you get a movie that right, I just assume mm-hmm. you just let it go, let it let it be a one and done. It is possible, America, to not have more of shit to ruin your shit and then well, complain about not. that shit. Pull a George Costanza, quit while your head. I'm out. <clears throat> exactly, I'm out. I'm done. <laughs> I think it hit all the all the marks, and and I I don't think you need another film. I really don't. But Spider Man did what I didn't think was possible. And it got me reinvested in a, in a movie I was dreading. I, I was dreading that movie. I mean, you guys know that. We talked about it. I'm like, well, it better. It's going to have to work its ass off to win me over. And it did. <laughs> um, I think Garfield nailed Peter Parker. I think Emma Stone was good. I, I don't have this creepy obsession you do with her because she has giant saucer eyes. Uh, but she is a very cute cute girl. And she does a great job with, with that role. They, they have a nice chemistry. I think they're dating, dating now, which they should because they feel like a good match. Um, but now I got the origin. Some, somebody's got to fill the void that that Robert Pattinson and Kristen Stewart have left us. <laughs> exactly. But now that they have the origin story out of the way, I really want to see what direction they're going to take the series. So I'm really excited about. Yeah, I want to see a more interesting villain too. Yeah, yeah. Brian. All right, I ain't going to puss out like you did. Um, I'm going to go with Prometheus. Ooh, I, I was thinking about that. I want more information. <laughs> yeah. I sat there for two and a half hours or whatever it was, and and. I need more of a, I need this bridge between this movie and the alien franchise built a little bit closer. You know, I, I need that, that bridge filled in a little bit. Yeah. I agree. I agree. I think for the word demands, Prometheus is probably the better fit than you did mine too. Yeah. I'm, I'm kind of with you. Let's say we demand a sequel because we didn't get enough from the original. Yeah, that's true. From the first movie. But still. <laughs> I guess they, it worked. Uh, of, this, of the sequels that we did get, which series should just freaking stop? Uh, my choice, Men in Black. Put a fork in it; it's done. Mine too. Amen. <laughs> we still a clean sweep on that one. Trifecta. Now, he, and I like no Piranha 3D. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. Double, double the terror, double the violence, double the D's. I think that's a clever ass slogan. How do you, how do you do that with a three? Triple D? Oh, I guess you could. I don't know. I don't, I don't know. I don't want to know. <laughs> what was the worst movie you saw this weekend, Brian, or this summer, Brian? Brave. Wow. Really? Yep. That's the it worst. Was beautiful. It's it's beautiful. It it's just the detail, you know, the 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 way that the advances they've made in the animation and everything is phenomenal. I give it all the credit in the world for that. But the the outside of the visuals, there just wasn't much else. The humor was predictable and lazy. The story was basic. I just it just didn't other than sitting there looking at a pretty picture, I I would have rather just put my headphones in and just looked at the pretty pictures that's wow so ballsy what about uh, you Aaron? my choice was the dictator effing awful Ooh, that bad huh? just awful it takes a lot for me to want to walk out of a movie and that movie i wanted to walk out the entire movie do you remember what you gave that i gave it a four but there were because there's a couple of clever scenes and stuff there's there's some clever stuff to it i mean most of it's in the trailer but overall the movie's just horrible just hmm. just not just sad. He's done, isn't he? No, I think it made enough internationally. He'll get another crack at something, but mm-hmm. I just... I, I think he's he's one of those guys that, that's better as a supporting character. Mm-hmm. Yes. He's very funny when he's a supporting character, but I just... I'm just... Bur- I'm burned out with him. I'm burned yeah. out. He was awesome in Hugo. Yeah. He was a supporting yeah. character. Yeah. That's like what a, he's saying. Yeah. What about you, Scott? Moonrise Kingdom. That's yeah. That, oh, I give it a two. Yeah, no, I, I still have yet to get an email from a listener to explain to me why this movie is good. I, it's because five people saw it, uh, and nobody that true. listens to our podcast probably. That's true, but I, I was told that this is the most accessible of, of his movies, and 
I've never wanted a movie to end so quickly in my entire life. Awful. Just so bad. <laughs> All right. Top three. What are our top three summer movies? Scott, why don't you go first? Mine's no surprise. It's it's the comic book sweep. The Avengers, Dark Knight Rises, and uh, The Amazing Spider-Man. Which order? Avengers, uh, Amazing Spider-Man, and then Dark Knight. One to three? Because mm-hmm. you're confusing me, and I don't appreciate that. <laughs> I like rules. I like a set of rules, man. Well, maybe you should put rules then. <laughs> I probably should. Brian, <laughs> what are your top three? <clears throat> Avengers, obviously number one. Where it does get a little surprising, number two, Battleship. Huh. Hey. And, and number three, Expendables, too. Why don't you explain Battleship? Because most people are going to hear that and go, what the is wrong with him? I know. I don't have Dark Knight, and I don't have Spider-Man on here. Not to say they weren't good. They were good. They didn't. I guess they made it to... I guess the, the, the bar that I had in my head for him. Mm-hmm. Battleship went way past that bar. I could and see that. My expectations were very low, but that movie was good all just good all around. It's just a good, fun action movie. And if you haven't seen it, I believe it's, what is it, out or yeah, coming it's, out? It's real out soon? on Blu ray and DVD. Go buy it. Don't even rent it. Don't buy a, don't rent it on the download or anything. Just, just go buy that movie. Absolutely. And I, but it was just, I was just, I was like you with Spider-Man. I went in with such low expectations that I was like, this is going to be horrible. All it is, is just rehashing of some leftover Transformers effects. <laughs> and, you know, it's going to be bad, but totally blown away by it. And I guess because it surprised me so much, I had to rank it number two. Expendables 2 was just one of the most fun movies of the summer. And... That was basic, you know, basically it with that one. So I'll concur with Battleship. It, it, I feel bad for it because nobody saw it. And it, yeah. and it got a lot of slack. And Taylor Kitsch, the poor guy, his career is just, you know, he's he's going back down and he was riding high. It's not his fault. It's not his fault. But the movie was fun as hell. It, it was, went up against the Avengers right when it was juggernauting. You know, it really had no chance. I mean, the whole concept is ludicrous. The story's dumb. The acting's kind of laughable the movie's fun as hell yeah just yeah no 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 brain required just zero if you like transformers you like battleship promise you uh my top three number three amazing spider-man number two expendables two because that was as brian said some of the most fun i've had in a the theater in a long time and number one as clean sweep the avengers hmm. i don't know how you know i'm sure somebody i want to i can't wait to see some of the other already or critics their top picks I like Moonrise Kingdom and <laughs> or really just that one, one through three. It was that good. Um, so we'd like to hear some of you. If you guys have some, some surprising number one picks or favorite movies or favorite movie lines. Or Not stuff like, like mine. That. The top three grossing movies for the <laughs> yeah, entire summer. <laughs> um, if, if you got some stuff you, you liked about the summer movies that you want to share, then send us an email to feedback at thehollywoodoutsider.com. We'd like to hear about them. Right now, we got a couple of emails to read before we wrap the show up. Uh, this one comes from Jesse M. It says, hey, guys, that's the crow, right? She's guessing in our movie clip. I remember watching it as a kid, totally inappropriate for my age and loving it. Does it hold up over time? Thanks for that flashback. The answer is yes, it does hold up. Damn it. Um, on a side note, have you guys seen the trailer for Sinister? Can't remember if you've mentioned it. I'm sick of the generic one-word titles for horror movies that makes them all run together. But this, But, man, this thing was creepy. Of course, creepy kids scare me more than just about anything, so maybe that's all it is. You should check it out. Well, two things. One, all kids should scare you if you don't have any yet. And number two, we've got some cool news about Sinister, but I can't share it yet, so you're just going to have to hold tight. So keep listening to the podcast. Thanks, as always, for the awesome podcast. Thanks for using the word awesome. Jesse M. Uh, Jesse also had another portion to her email, but we are going to save it because she suggests a really good idea for a main topic, and we're going to use it on episode 60. Brian, you got another Sweet. email. Yeah, this one's from uh, our good friend, Sue. She says, what's up, hoes? Just spent a lovely morning with the Jaws Blu-ray. Gorgeous, simply gorgeous. Looks like a small army went on over to Amity Island, turned on the lights, and hit everything with a fresh coat of paint. If you haven't picked it up and you're a Jaws fan as I am, and who in their right mind isn't, I highly recommend it. The flick has always stood the test of time, but the remastering just makes it even better. I was dubious that there was that there would be that much of a difference to justify the purchase, but holy shit, was it worth it. <laughs> makes, makes me wish I had been old enough to see the original on the big screen. Side note, the extras were phenomenal too. 
Hope Scott is feeling well enough to return next week. His presence was missed. Not in a, gosh, but does that guy know his movies way? But missed nonetheless. <laughs> nice. <laughs> also hope all went well with folks throwing shit at you over at Rockford U booth. If Brian's present had been promised, I would have been tempted to make my drive, make the drive over there to throw myself at him. Being I'm a lawbreaker and all. <laughs> Later, fellas. Sue. Thanks. Thank you, Sue. <laughs> Thanks, Sue. Um, you can always find us on thehollywoodoutsider.com, facebook.com forward slash thehollywoodoutsider. Email us at feedback at thehollywoodoutsider.com. Tell your friends, subscribe on iTunes, Zoom, Google, Reader, listen on your Stitcher radio app. Give us a thumbs up if you do, or any plain old RSS feed. We're also on rockfordcollegeradio.com every Thursday from 4 to 6. I want to thank each of the podcasters. Brian Williams, thanks for being here, B. My pleasure. Scotty Clark. Glad thanks. to be here, man. Uh, thanks for coming. Justin McCumber, of course, will be back uh, next week. He's he's still enjoying his casa, so we really hope he's having a fun time. I think there were some some problems with getting his furniture, so hopefully he's got something to sit on right now <laughs> while he's listening to The Hollywood Outsider. Next week, we'll be back with more news, a new topic, and more on the next Hollywood Outsider. So the next time you go to the theater, from all of us, buy popcorn. <laughs> Visit, I just wanna go home. You're unable to understand that I'm doing the best I can, and all I know is all I rather be on. I'm going backpacking, and I'm trying to figure out, how can I find a TV <laughs> in the middle of the woods? Do you get any reception out there? Like, uh, we will here, because we're actually going. We're not We're not going as rough as we normally do. You could probably get, like, we're gonna, or We're going to use KY this time. How Avengers heavy do you think this is going to be? <laughs> yeah, I ain't scared. Yeah, see? I ain't scared of taking it or giving it. That uh, whoa. Yeah, cut that out. Whoa. <laughs> <laughs> what was that, Brian? I, I, could, I couldn't hear you. What was that? <laughs> <laughs> Women's laundry is impossible to fold. It's a pain in the ass to fold or to hang up that shit. Well, it depends. If you've got a big woman, it's probably easier because it's a lot bigger. <laughs> There's more to fold. If you've got a small woman, those little panties are hard. <laughs> you gonna bark all day little doggy or you gonna bite <laughs> well I was being nice you want me to bite I will <laughs> Brian, between Brian and I we can make you cry before this thing's over I believe it <laughs> <laughs>